Hello, in this video we're going to explore the English Bible and particularly the King James Bible. And I'll show you some problems that are in all English Bibles, not only the King James. And which is why I would say the King James Bible is not perfect. It's, it's a good translation, but it's not perfect. Um, and uh, good morning everybody. This week we're going to talk about the King James Bible. Now before we can talk about that, uh, I think we should talk about a little bit of background about the Bible and about the scriptures themselves. Now, uh, now the, the Hebrew scriptures are pretty much um, irrefutable. There, there, there's very, very few um, differences between different manuscripts found. The oldest uh, complete manuscripts being in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date back to about oh, 100 or 200 BC. But there are portions of manuscripts that are much older than that, which also are no different than the newer versions. Now the complete Hebrew Bible is, um, the, the, that we know of was once complete and then it got burned in a war. Um, that was the Aleppo manuscript which was about 700 AD in Galilee uh, the, in Tiberias which was a Jewish city and it was called the Aleppo manuscript. Uh, then uh, once that manuscript got burned, I guess the Muslims in a war took it and they burned a part of it. So it's still there, but it's no longer complete. The next oldest complete manuscript is the Leningrad manuscript, which is about 1000 AD. And uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found very, very, very little change from the older ones to the 1000 AD ones. So there's not a lot of contention over the Jewish um, Hebrew manuscripts. Now the New Testament is quite different because we don't have... Um, okay, first of all, we don't even know what language they were originally written in. Some of the Gospels uh, seem to have been written originally in Hebrew or Aramaic because of these sentence structures and because of some of the words being used they seem to be uh, translated from an original Hebrew or Aramaic into Greek and um, the book of Revelation also it seems to be a Hebrew structure to it and uh, possibly was later uh, translated into Greek and what we have um, now the only manuscripts we have are the Greek manuscripts. Now there's a long tradition in the Eastern Church through the Byzantine Empire the Greek manuscripts had always been in Greek and the Greek language, uh, there's an ancient Greek language, and then there's a, a the, as the Greek language got more modernized, the, the manuscripts were updated. Um, you have to understand how books w were used back in the ancient times. Books would wear out, and they, they were written on sheepskin or, or on papyrus, and they would wear out and and after 10 years or so they would uh, have to get a new copy and each copy was written by hand and so the originals are long gone um, it's very rare to find any uh, manuscripts that are that old and um, so what we have from the New Testament is See, the, the Hebrews had a whole culture and a whole nation 
surrounding their manuscripts. And so there was a, a culture in the Dead Sea who actually buried their manuscripts. What they would do was when, when the student would write out the scrolls, and he would write everything out except for the name of God on the scrolls. And then the uh, master of the students would read them. And if he approved them, he would write the name of God into them. And um, if they were not approved, then they were not just thrown in the garbage. They were actually buried in a burial. And that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. They're, they're the burial of unapproved manuscripts. Now, what they can do is they can look at the mistakes and they can they can tell where which were the mistakes and uh, why they were unapproved and not put into circulation. And they can find from that that uh, what it should have said. And what we have now is what it should have said. You, you can buy a Hebrew Bible today and in, written in Hebrew. And it's pretty much the same as what it was at the time of Christ. And now at the time of Christ, there was also a Greek Hebrew Bible translated into Greek, which we still have. It's called the Septuagint. And... Um, a lot of the, uh, in the New Testament, the quotes that they quote the scriptures, the quotes are from the Septuagint. Now, we don't know if they quoted the scriptures in Hebrew in, originally, and then they were updated to Septuagint readings, or whether they were quoting the Septuagint. We just don't know. Because we don't have this uh, long established nation supporting these manuscripts from the New Testament. The, the, they were actually driven underground. They were, they were outlaws for 200 years. And um, so we don't have any manuscripts from those times. The only manuscripts we have are from the Romans who became Christian. And now there's the Eastern and the Western Roman Empire. And the Eastern Empire continued with the Greek, while the, the Western Empire translated theirs into Latin. And so we have the Greek and the Latin. Now, um, now before the empire split between East and West, there was a, a, a Bible written by a man named Eusebius, and um, a translation by Eusebius in about the third century. And that becomes important to us later. Now, um, as the Bible became, um, the, the Eastern and Western church split from each other. So the, the Eastern church was using the Greek manuscripts and the Western Church using the Latin manuscripts. And then after the Muslim invasion of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople fell, then the Greeks scholars fled into Europe, or some of them, and they had with them the Greek manuscripts. And there was a scholar named Erasmus who compared the Greek manuscripts with the Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate, which was the official Bible of the Western Empire. And uh, he found many discrepancies that the Latin Vulgate had been altered in order to conform with Catholic doctrine. The main alteration being that instead of repentance, it said penance. And that uh, eventually led to uh, a great reformation um, that happened in Europe. Now, um, so that reformation uh, was also uh, an underground illegal movement because the entire government was against anyone trying to translate the Bible and trying to show people 
that it said anything other than what the Latin Vulgate said and that it could be read by anyone other than someone who knew Latin and uh, it was too holy to translate into other languages so eventually that broke into like a war in England that went back and forth and that war ended up producing the King James Bible and this is the uh, the official Bible by the King of England I have a copy here I got this at a used bookstore or like a um, not a used bookstore but uh, what's it called a uh, thrift store <laughs> that uh, I got it for ten dollars actually it's a very good deal I would like to thank the husband and wife in this book James and Deborah thank you very much for this Bible and this is a King James Version I use the King James Version when, when I have a, when I go to an English Bible I go to the King James it's a very good translation but it is certainly not perfect translation and uh, there's a lot of problems in it that we will see but it's still the best English Bible out there and the reason for that is that after the war and the King James Bible was finally made and there was these two Bibles mainly the King James Bible and the Geneva Bible the Geneva Bible was brought to America by the pilgrims and it was uh, trusted more by the Puritans than the King James Bible because they didn't trust the crown of England to make a good translation and they were right in some cases and um, the, the uh, Geneva Bible has a lot of notes in it from the reformers and it's quite, a to quite toxic in some places, the notes, uh, toxic towards the papacy. And um, I guess the, the King of England wanted to make a Bible that didn't have all of those notes in it and, and was, was more uh, um, pal palatable for the English people, I suppose and um, that would maybe lessen the war that was ongoing and was never going to end things like that and also this this bible the notes also have a lot to say about kings which uh, the king of england would not have appreciated so they wanted to make a english bible without any notes and only have the the words of the scripture translated see the the Geneva Bible it has notes if you look at uh, anywhere in here you'll see in all the margins you'll see all the notes down both sides in all the margins and those are notations by the reformers that will talk about the scripture in question and talk about what they thought it means and uh, there's some quite interesting ones especially if you get up into Revelation okay if you look at uh, Revelation chapter 17 in the Geneva Bible okay and now you have these notes down on the side right see on the side here these notes it's talking about the revelation and here's a perfect example of what they didn't like is uh, this note here says uh, this woman the woman riding the beast this woman is the Antichrist that is the Pope with the whole body of his filthy creatures as is expounded whole because only 
stands in outward pomp and impudence and craft like a trumpet like a like a trumpet of half doctrines and blasphemies which no one knows how to avoid but the elect this is the Roman Empire which being fallen into decay the whore of Rome usurped authority and proceeded from the devil and tether that shall return which are ab about Rome so you see like the type of notes in this book that um, they wanted to get rid of and everybody was carrying Geneva Bibles the Puritans especially and uh, they were taking them all over the world and this was spreading everywhere so their answer the King of England's answer to um, stop there was a war between um, in the in the Church of England the Puritans were against the Church of England because they saw it as just another whore of Babylon and um, to try to bring the nation back together and try to get rid of these ideas they brought out the King James Bible and the the King James Bible was supposed to reunite England under one Bible and uh, the Puritans were being oppressed and they ended up creating a new society in Massachusetts Bay uh, in Boston and that was the Puritan uh, exile or the, the Puritan exodus they call it so there we have the King James Bible now there there is the King James Bible perfect um, I would say no no it's not perfect <laughs> It's, um, it's very close to perfect. It, it, it is a... Uh, now, with the King James Bible, the, the strengths of the King James Bible are it's using the Hebrew manuscripts, the uh, Masoretic text, which is the original Hebrew text, as far as anyone can tell. And uh, there's no big deal about believing that. Now there's contention over the New Testament texts. Now what's happened is that Erasmus, who I uh, mentioned early, earlier, he um, sort of collected all of the Greek manuscripts he could find, and he sort of collated them into one Greek text to say, this is what I've been able to figure out which is the entire Bible, all that we can find. And um, there are many different um, versions of the Greek text that you will find. There's like 20, 30 versions and different, um, different phases of the Greek language, which you will find these versions in. And some of them are very old. I think the oldest is somewhere around 1000 A.D., of the uh, Eastern Greek manuscripts um, and uh, so that's where we get our New Testament Greek Bible from if you want it the original Greek version it comes out of the Eastern Church the uh, the and the Byzantine Empire so um, what happened was they, they used those Greek manuscripts and it's compiled together and that compilation is called the Textus Receptus, the, which is Latin for received text. And so that um, was made by the reformers. They, they took that up from Erasmus and uh, they, they refined it and it was the final accepted version or collection um, into one manuscript, one Greek manuscript or one Greek collection that was used by the reformers and used by Tyndale who was a forerunner of the King James Version 
and um, so the, the the translators of the King James Version they sort of collected together all that was available they took the Latin Vulgate they took the, the, the Textus Receptus they took the Hebrew Masoretic text uh, I think they had the Leningrad text and um, and whatever else they could find and they also compared like Tyndale's writings, the Coverdale Bible, the Great Bible, the, the Latin Vulgate, maybe Wycliffe's Bible, and Lutheran's Bible, all these Bibles that had been translated. And they kind of looked at everything and said, okay, we're going to come up with the best we can come up with. And it was teams and teams of scholars from Oxford and Cambridge and that kind of stuff. So that's what they came up with, the King James Bible. And that has been the King of England's public domain Bible ever since 1610, 1611. So now after that, there was other manuscripts, two in particular, two manuscripts found. One was found, this would be about 200 years later, in uh, maybe, I don't know, somewhere around the beginning of the 19th century, okay? And uh, they, 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 there was two manuscripts found. One was called the Codex Vaticanus. It was like the Vatican, all of a sudden, they always hated any translations besides their own. And then they came up with their own English translation once the King James uh, was uh, made because they always want a, an alternative to show their opinions. And that, that's where the Dewey Rhymes Bible came from. That's a, the official Catholic uh, English translation. And... Um, all of a sudden, this, um, by this manuscript comes up found in the Vatican Library. Oh, well, what do you know? What do you know? They didn't know anything about it. And all of a sudden, there it is. And they also found uh, another manuscript in um, <clears throat> the uh, Mount Sinai Monastery in Egypt. Um, and that one was kind of a questionable manuscript. It's the most corrected manuscript ever found in history. And it's corrected by a teacher. It's got correction marks all over it. And it's got verses missing. And it's, it's just, it would receive an F. The student should have got an F for writing it. But since it's the oldest manuscript of the two oldest ones, they're both from the third century, supposed to be uh, Erasmus's Bible, um, that um, they use this manuscript to say, well, all these uh, certain verses should be removed from the Bible. So you will find that any version other than the King James Version you will find that, um, and anything before that, you will find verses removed from the Bible. Now, these removed verses, um, I can't remember the name of the book, but there was a scholar who went through, and, and if you look at all the early church fathers from the early uh, first few centuries of Christian Christianity, you will find them um, quoting or alluding to these supposedly removed verses, which proves that those verses were not removed before the first two centuries. They were removed after that. And uh, so there's this whole controversy over the uh, Greek texts. So I myself, I go with the Texas Receptus because if you really look at it, you've got, okay, who were the reformers? These were people trying to re, re, 
retrieve that which was lost, trying to find um, God's word and trying to get as close as they can in all truth and trying to recover God's word. And then what are the other Bibles, the, Bible, the, the other texts from the Vatican and Sinaiticus, they are in answer to that. So they, they would, I would call them counter-reformation texts. And then there was a guy named Nestle who took those two uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus texts and kind of put them together into one what he would say would be the original Bible, and that's called the Nestle text. So you got this Nestle text now competing with the Textus Receptus. Now the Textus Receptus is what the Reformers came up with, and we wouldn't have an English Bible if it wasn't for the Reformers. And it's still, it's still in the law of the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent, which is still Roman Catholic Church law, that you cannot translate the Bible into any vernacular language other than Latin. And you cannot write anything that disagrees with the Latin Vulgate. So these um, people who, uh, who believe this, have an agenda they want to pollute our Bible to say to make their Bible look better so I go with what the reformers came up with and I am and I'm highly suspect of these other manuscripts that they cho seem to have chosen oh we found them oh we found them no I think they chose them and they foisted them on us as a, as some kind of a rebuttal to what the reformers came up with. So I'll go with the King James Bible and um, any Bible after that is suspect. It, 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 it's using the wrong manuscripts for the Greek texts. For the Hebrew they're all using the same but the uh, for the New Testament they're using different manuscripts. So that is what the, the big contention is over using the King James versus using other Bibles. Now some people will use the Geneva Bible and um, they, they, they don't even trust the King James Bible. And that's the, the, sort of the story behind all of that. Now to come up and start to say that the King James Bible is perfect, which some people say, I disagree with that. I, I would say it's the best English translation we have, all in all, but it's sure not perfect. So let's take a look at some of the problems with the King James. And I just want to be uh, very clear that I'm not saying the King James is a bad translation. I would say it is a good translation. It's a, it's a very faithful translation. And they did the best they could in the 17th century, the beginning of the 17th century, with what they had. But we have much more at our fingertips now than they did. And so we can go on our computer, we can compare notes, we can look at everything. Everything's been taken apart and dissected. Every word in the Bible has been dissected by scholars. So we have a lot of information at our fingertips now. And we can look and see. I'll show you some things that are a problem in all English Bibles. Okay? So let's take a look. Now don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Help out the channel. If you like these videos, it helps uh, to keep it going. Okay, we're looking at the King James Version here, right here, King James Version. We see, okay, this is Book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 15. So Jacob went down into Egypt. So now I'm going to switch to the Textus Receptus. 
which is the Greek text that I talked about earlier. And there it is, this word right here. Yaakov. That's, the, that's Jacob in Greek, Yaakov. So there we go, that's good translation. But, let's take a look at another thing here. King James Version. Let's go to James. James, a servant of God. What's it say in the Texas Receptus? Jacobus. Jacobus. A servant of God. So why is uh, Jacobus? Jacobus is the uh, Hellenized version of Jacob. So it's Jacobus. It's a Hellenized way of saying Jacob. The the you know the um, the Hebrews. If you if you ever heard about the uh, the Maccabees and the Maccabean revolt. The uh, Greeks, uh, under Alexander the Great, the Greeks took over all of the Middle East. And uh, after Alexander, the, uh, the um, Greek king, uh, the Seleucid Empire, uh, Antiochus, he uh, was trying to force the uh, Hellenization on the Jews. And they, that's when they revolted. But before they revolted, they uh, they did become quite Hellenized, and um, so and and Greek was sort of in in that whole part of the world. Greek was the standard uh, language, the 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 language of commerce. So there were Hellenized names. Uh, Jacobus was a Hellenized version of Jacob. So when they talked about Jacob, the original Jacob, they, they said Yaakov. But when uh, they're talking about a new Jacob, like a, a Jacob living now, they called him Yaakobus. Or, we're not sure, because maybe somebody uh, wrote this into Greek and Hellenized it later. You know, maybe this was added uh, after the letter of James was written. But James, uh, there is no James in the Bible. There's Jacobus. Uh, how does it get turned into James? Because in the Latin Vulgate, in the Latin version, they name him Yamas. And uh, then it got translated into English from the Latin into James. So then uh, now the translator is writing the King James Version. Why didn't they ch tell the truth of what it says? It's Jacobus. Like there is, uh, he is a namesake of Jacob. He was named Jacob by his parents. You see, and this is a Hellenized version of that name. So why, where do they get the right to, to change it into a completely different name now, James? You see? Now, why wouldn't they change that to Jacob? Because uh, maybe King James wouldn't be so happy about that if they changed his name to Jacob. So you can see... Uh, not a bad translation, but not perfect. I wouldn't say it's perfect. If it was perfect, then this translation, you would have to translate this name as Jacobus or Jacob. Okay, so there's one problem. Let's take a look at another one. John chapter 18. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Let's take a look at the Textus Receptus. 
Judas, Judas. So here's uh, Hebrews chapter 8. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Let's look at the Textus Receptus. Judah. Judah. So now we can see that Judas is a Hellenized version of Judah. So is it correct to translate his name as Judas or as Judah? I don't know. It's like um, it's a, a, Greek, a Hellenized version of the name. So his parents called him Judah or Judas. They meant to name him after Judah. Um, he was named after Judah. Just like Jesus. Jesus was named after Joshua. Yeshua. So, um, you know, the names are really, really screwed up in the English versions, if you really look at it. So, there's one thing about, um, you know, problems with the King James Vent translation. And you'll also see that quite often in the King James, where you go from the Hebrew Scriptures to the Greek Scriptures. Um, even in the English translation, the names are changed. Because it was different translators di translating different portions of the Bible, and they didn't all translate it this, into the same name. So there's issues that way also. Okay, now let's take a look at this one now. This is in Genesis chapter 38. If we remember the story of Judah and his two sons, right? His first, his first son, here it is, an heir, Judas, starting in verse 7. An heir, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And uh, he had married... A, a, a woman whose name was Tamar. Tamar means palm tree. So Er was killed and then it was a custom in those days it was a custom when if your brother died and left a woman a wife childless it was your your duty to give that woman a child because otherwise she would not really be a part of the family and she would have nowhere to go you know and and it, she would have to live live a widow as live as a widow the rest of her life, um, with no children. So. So Judah said to Onan, the second-born son, "Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up a seed to your brother." And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, so it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife, Tamar, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he slew him also. So now Judah has lost two sons. Okay. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at your father's house, till Shelah, my the third born son is grown up for he said lest preadventure he die also as his brothers did and tamar and went and dwelt in her father's house and in the process of time the daughter of shua judah's wife died and judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears to tinath and he and his friend hira the altarite all the right. <laughs> and it was told to Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law goes up to Timnath to shear his sheep. And she put, all, all, she put her widow's garments off and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah, the son that was promised to her as a husband, was grown and she was not given to him for a wife. 
When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot, because she covered her face. So what is this? This is in verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot. And he said to her, by the way, he said, Go, I pray thee, let me come in to thee. For he knew not that she was a, his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, What will you give me a pledge till you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Your signet ring and your bracelets and your staff. So this is his signs of his kingship. And he gave it to her and came into her, and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. Okay, so she got a child off of Judah by tricking him, right? So... He thought her to be a harlot, it says right here in verse 15. Okay, so here we are looking at the Hebrew in Genesis 38, Genesis 38, 15, okay? It's when he says, okay, Fayashevcha lezona. And that means, and he thought her to be a harlot, Zana, and that's from the word Zana, a harlot. So let's take a look at the Strong's number, and that is to commit fornication, to play the harlot, right, to commit adultery, to be a cult prostitute, so to be a uh, a uh, fornicating woman. So now if we go back to the King James and we go okay and and Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adolamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand but he found her not. Then he asked the men of that place saying where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? That's verse 21. He asked the people of the town, Where is the harlot? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. So let's take a look at this. Verse 21. There it is there. Lamor saying, Where? Aye Hadosh Hakadosha, the harlot. Okay, where is the harlot? This guy's asking, where is the harlot that was in this place? And and they answered and said, There was in this there was not lo. Lo Hayata Beze. There was not in this place a harlot. But well, this this is a different word than the than Zane that when Judah found her, he thought her to be a harlot. Right? This is a kad kadosha. And what does kadosh mean? The King James Version translates this in the following manner. Harlot. Whore. What's Kadosh? A sodom sodomite. What's Kadash? To be holy, consecrated, set apart. Kadosh. Kadosh means holy. In Hebrew, the word kadosh means holy. But the King James translates kadosha as a harlot. 
and Kadesh, which is a noun, right, as a sodomite or unclean. So the masculine noun is a sodomite and the feminine noun is a harlot. But what does it really mean in Hebrew? Kadosh means holy. So what it really means is a holy man or a holy woman. The word, and then here's it, here it is. He returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of that place said there was no harlot in this place. And the men of the place said that there was no harlot. Kadosha. So what does Kadosha actually translate as? Holy woman. And Kadesh is a holy man. Now it doesn't mean that they were not a prostitute. But the Bible says Kadosha, Kadesha, holy woman. Okay, so the proper way to translate this would be that he thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. And he said, let me come into you for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And then they sent the guy to look for her. And where where is the holy woman that was openly by the wayside? And they said, there was no holy woman in this place. And he returned, returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And the men of the place said, there was no holy woman in this place. And it came to pass, it was told to Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter has played the harlot, Zana. So uh, there's uh, the word Zana being used. Lamor, it was said. Zana, Tamar. Tamar is a harlot. Okay? Because she's pregnant and she's a widow. Tana, thy daughter, has played the harlot, and behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. So, so Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, has played Zana. And behold, she is with child by whoredom. And what is whoredom? Lizanunim. Lizanunim. So there's the root. Z. Zion, noon. So it's the same root. The root is Zana. If we look here, Hordom. <laughs> From the root, Zana. Okay? So that's the same root. So it's all about Hordom. But when the man went to look for her, her he asked the people, Where is the holy woman? And then Judah said, when she was brought forth, she sent her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, who these are, the signet, bracelets, and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them, and she said, She has been more righteous than I. You see? So the, the Bible uh, does not refer to her as the man looking for a harlot, he went looking for a holy woman. So this makes Judah's sin even worse because she wasn't a harlot. She was a temple prostitute. She was a holy woman on the roadside. So why does the uh, Bible, why does the King James Version not translate that holy woman as holy woman. It translates it as harlot. So there's another imperfection. So remember the the harlot with the spies? Joshua 6.22 Now remember um, 
in Joshua 6.22, um, the spies that went in to spy out Jericho and the prostitute that helped the spies and let them down through her window and they saved the prostitute for helping them. But Joshua said to the two men that spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all she has as you swore to her. And then in this verse, they're using the word Zana. Bring out the Zana. Okay, so I'm not going to belabor this too far with uh, doing more examples like that. But we can see there that they're interpreting it for us. The guy was asking for a holy woman. And they just say, well, he means a whore. Or about a holy man. Well, he means a sodomite. So where was the holy man in Sodom? I don't know. Um, I haven't looked it up. But you can see little things like that. And um, the other thing that they did was, uh, this isn't only King James. This is all Bibles. Um, for God... When something is associated with God, they come up with a new word when in the Hebrew there is no new word. Like a messenger. When a king says a messenger, it's the same Hebrew word as when God sends an angel. It just means messenger. So, the messenger of the Lord. They translate it as the angel of the Lord. And the messenger of the king, they translate it as the messenger of the king. Even though it's the same word in Hebrew. Um, sanctuary. Uh, the, the, the tent. right, The tabernacle of God. is Really, it's the word tent. So when, when a man's living in it, it's a tent. When God lives in it, it's a tabernacle. So, um, they do things like that, you know. Uh, when man, when David lives in a palace, it's a palace. But when God lives in a palace, it's a temple. So, it's the same Hebrew word, though. So, you know, the, all these things that they, they interpret for you. And, and they put their culture into it. Or they put our culture into it. Where in the original Hebrew Bible, it wasn't, those distinctions were not being made. And, and you'll see that being done by all English Bibles. And, um, you know, it's, it's really unfair. And when we get into uh, trying to decipher, you know, very cryptic, prophecies and they're doing that kind of stuff in the background it throws you way off it, it it really is not helpful so you know they're they're not um something that's gonna um you know endanger your salvation and if you only want to read the bible in english and you want a good translation i would recommend the king james version if I was going to buy a Bible for somebody to give it to them, I would get a King James Bible. Um, because it's the most trustworthy English translation, in my opinion. Now, um, but if you want to study prophecy and you want to really go deep into it, you have to go to the original language. Because all the English versions... They interpret it for you. They, they, you're going to miss a lot of details. And, and you could get things really, really wrong because you don't understand the original language. And the English translation could be better, but it just isn't. Um, it's like a, a car, you know. A Model T is a great car. It's a dependable car, a wonderful car. But I wouldn't take a Model T out on the highway today because it's not fast enough 
and it's not safe enough. The tires aren't good enough. The windows aren't good enough. It's just not a good car for today. But it's a great car for a hundred years ago. And it's a great car if you just want to drive around the block and have fun. But it's not a good practical car for commuting to work, you know. Um, so, you know, if you just want to read the Bible, you're fine with it. Uh, King James is great. But it's not perfect enough if you want to study in detail and start uh, splitting hairs in the Word of God and, and, and making distinctions then the, the King James version, version is not adequate because you know they're telling you it's a harlot when, they, when, when it says holy woman they're telling you sodomite when it says holy man like how are we supposed to what are they going to do to Daniel's prophecies or Isaiah's prophecies or Zechariah or Ezekiel's prophecies how do we know what they're doing behind the scenes so it's perfect, but it's not perfect enough for me. Um, so that's my take on it, is I would not call it perfect, uh, but it is a good translation. And I would recommend it to a person who is not a Bible scholar and who just wants to read the Bible in English. It's the best we got, the King James Bible. Perfect, not by a long shot. So thank you very much. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe, so that you can see more videos like this, and we'll see you next week.